Wolf Thai Sound Chart. Insights and analysis from one of the leading law firms in Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe. Hi and welcome to another episode of our Wolf Thai Sound Chart Podcast Digital Law Edition. My name is Roland Marco and I'm a Vienna-based partner at Wolf Thais, focusing on data and tech. Today I will be joined by my colleague Lisa Bernsteiner. Hello and welcome also from my side. And in this episode we'll discuss the EU's cybersecurity strategy and give you an overview on the latest developments in this area. Lisa, you are an associate in our IP TMT practice group and you focus on cyber security and data protection law. Besides your legal degree, you also have a technical education in software development, which makes you particularly <laughs> suitable to support clients from a legal and technical perspective. What is your take on recent development as regards EU's uh, cyber security strategy? Thank you for the nice introduction, Roland. Cybersecurity in general has been a hot topic in the last couple of years, given that cyber incidents are on the rise constantly and threat actors have been keeping companies and external advisors busy. That's why the EU has decided it is high time it tackled these challenges and adopted several new legal acts. Just to set the scene, this uh, episode can only give an overview on the recent developments in the cybersecurity field. It cannot be um, exhaustive. Yeah? One that has probably raised the most awareness in recent times uh, certainly is the NIS2 directive. This directive uh, replaces the existing cybersecurity framework throughout the EU, which is uh, currently governed by the NIS1 directive, as we call it, which um, member states have transposed already into national law. So this is the law currently in force. As opposed to its uh, legal predecessor, um, the NIS2 will lead to a much stricter framework by both broadening the scope of application and by bringing further compliance requirements to the table. The directive entered into force in January 2023 already and member states now will have to transpose it to national law by 18 October 2024 at the latest, so autumn this year. Lisa, could you give us an overview about the scope of application and how that's different from the existing framework? Sure, Roland. Um, the NIS2 directive is a legislative act that aims at uh, achieving a high common level of cybersecurity across the European Union. It is all about building cybersecurity capabilities, mitigating threats to network and information systems used to provide essential services in key sectors. So for um for critical infrastructure providers, let's put it that way. Correct. And it aims on ensuring the continuity of such services when facing incidents. For enhancing the market's resilience against cyber threats, the scope of application has been significantly widened. Both the entity's size and the entity's area of service are decisive for the scope of application of NIS2. Even regardless of their size, the framework applies to providers of public electronic communication networks or of publicly available electronic communication services, trust service providers and domain name system service providers. Other entities offering services within certain sectors will be covered if they are qualified as at least medium-sized entity. The sectors covered by NIS2 were significantly broadened compared to the existing framework. Whereas the current framework mainly focuses on the sectors energy, transport, health and infrastructure, the NIS2 will add additional players onto the field. For example, also providers of postal and career services, production, processing and distribution of food as well as manufacturing services have been added. Indeed, the NIS2 uh, regime uh, will cover several new sectors that previously have not been subject to cybersecurity requirements under the currently existing uh, NIS1 framework. And this will bring a lot of challenges to these newly covered entities as they will have to start the implementation almost from scratch. Lisa, you mentioned that NIS2 will bring stricter rules for service providers. Can you further elaborate on the changes NIS2 will bring compared to its predecessor framework in this respect. 
First and foremost, the NIS2 will shift its focus compared to the existing framework. Whereas under the existing framework, the focus lies on an essential service within a certain entity, the NIS2 does not restrict compliance requirements solely to a certain service offered in a sector covered. This means that a sufficient risk management required by NIS2 basically will not be limited to the network and information systems the entity uses to operate a certain critical service, Rather, it will be the whole entity offering services in a relevant sector being covered. Therefore, the entity has to ensure that all of its network and information systems are subject to adequate risk management measures in order to be fully compliant with NIS2. As regards the applicability of the new rule set, the compliance requirements will ex lege apply to important and essential entities without any further act of determination or whatsoever being required. So uh, there, there will be no decision by an authority yeah, right. assigning this particular... That's right, yeah, it will be ex lege. So if the criteria are met, entities will simply have to comply with NIS2 and in particular establish an adequate risk management. Interesting. Um, new EU regulation almost never comes without any reporting obligation right. and that's also the case with NIS2, as you could think of. Um, entities are required to notify the competent authority of any significant incident by following a multi-level reporting process. And most importantly, from a management perspective, according to NIS2, members of management bodies of essential and important entities can be held personally liable by the entity for infringements relating to the risk management requirements. Wow, so the NIS2 directive requires quite extensive preparations uh, by entities, starting with determining whether or not they fall within the scope of application in the first place. Given the compliance requirements will be applicable in full from when the national implementation law has entered into force, preparations in terms of the risk management within the company need to start now. Lisa, can you give us a short overview about what's required for the risk management in this respect? Of course. The directive requires entities to take what it calls appropriate and proportionate technical, operational and organizational measures to manage the risks posed to the security of network and information systems, which they use for their operations or for the provision of their services. Now, while that sounds quite uh, bulky, simply put, it's all about that such measures need to prevent or minimize the impact of incidents on recipients of the services or on other uh, services. Generally speaking, NIS2 pursues four objectives in the area of cybersecurity, namely ensuring the availability, authenticity, integrity and confidentiality of the data transmitted or the services provided via the network and information systems. The risk management shall thus aim at ensuring a level of security appropriate to the risks posed. For that purpose, measures should take into account the state of the art and, where applicable, relevant European and international standards, as well as the cost of implementation. So, to put it simply, entities covered need to first conduct a risk analysis to determine the risks post to their network and information systems. And this then serves as a starting point to identify technical, operational and organizational measures adequately addressing these identified risks. Therefore, there will be no one size fits all solution. Rather, the adequate risk management will differ from entity to entity, which will make an individual analysis inevitable. A special focus of NIS2 lies on cybersecurity within the supply chain. Also in terms of cybersecurity, it's valid to say that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link and the EU legislature thus took this to heart and requires entities to address security risks arising from its relationships with its direct suppliers or service providers. This aims at preventing the security of the entity's network and information systems from being compromised by exploiting vulnerabilities associated with third-party products and services. The extent of the layers being affected from this obligation will be up to the national member states to determine. While the directive itself only requires supply chain security in terms of the entity's direct suppliers, member states could indeed go beyond that and widen the layer of suppliers being covered. So there is room for the member states left still. I see. Um, the NIS2 is, um, however, only one and 
maybe the most prominent example of current uh, cybersecurity regulation in the EU. In parallel, also the Directive on Resilience of Critical Entities has entered into force, which aims at entities offering services which are essential for the maintenance of vital societal functions or economic activities in the EU. So another piece of, of, of legislation aiming on resilience of critical entities, in fact. Lisa, can you also give us an overview on what this is about? Sure. Um, this directive aims at enhancing critical entities' resilience, preventing security incidents and minimizing the consequences of such incidents if they happen. Um, as entities covered by this directive will also be subject to NIS2, the requirements laid down by the NIS2 will prevail. So this means that the NIS2 will indeed conclusively govern entities' obligations in terms of their cyber resilience whereas the Directive on the Resilience of Critical Entities focuses on the physical protection of entities. Okay, so the, the differentiation is, is one is for the cyber resilience, the other is for the physical protection. That's right, that's right. So in particular, the ent critical entities will have to ensure protected access to the respective entity's physical location rather than just focusing on, on the cyber security. And like under the NIS2 directive, also for implementing adequate measures to ensure their physical resilience, a risk assessment uh, and management will of course be required. And then again, based on the risks, the physical entities exposed to appropriate and proportionate technical security and organizational measures are to be implemented. Um, member states have to implement the directive by 18th of October 2024 and uh, will be responsible for identifying critical entities in the sectors covered by the directive on a national level by 17th of July 2026. So other than under the NIS2, there will indeed be a separate legal act required um, which will determine the entity as critical. Mm -hmm. So immediate call to action, so to say. Definitely, yes. By autumn this year, okay. Besides that, um, the EU has also enacted sector-specific cybersecurity laws, for example, within the financial sector. The financial sector is extremely dependent, as we know, on technology and on tech companies to deliver financial services, making financial entities also vulnerable to cyber attacks or incidents. So the EU adopted the Digital Operational Resilience Act, in short, called DORA. DORA already entered into force on 16th January 2023, but will only become applicable in roughly six months from now, so on 17th January 2025. DORA will come into play to properly manage ICT risks that could otherwise lead to disruptions of financial services offered across borders. Such disruptions can in turn have an importance on other companies, sectors and even on the rest of the economy which underlines the importance of digital operational resilience in the financial sector in particular. Um, Lisa, what's, what to say on DORA from an IT and cybersecurity perspective? DORA will establish principles and requirements of an ICT risk management framework, including a third-party risk management. It will also specify key contractual provisions that need to be considered when using third-party ICT. DORA will also come along with a new oversight framework for critical ICT third-party providers. And in terms of resilience, DORA will require financial entities to conduct basic and advanced digital operational resilience testing in order to be aware of their weaknesses and being able to address these properly. Regarding ICT-related incidents, DORA will bring strict reporting obligations for major ICT-related incidents to the competent authorities. To further strengthen the whole sector's resilience, DORA will allow for the entities to exchange information and intelligence on cyber threats. As regulation, DORA is directly applicable without requiring the national member states to transpose it into national law. Um, regarding its interplay with the NIS2 directive, DORA will be considered a so-called sector-specific union legal act, leading to the NIS2 not being applicable to a certain extent at least. Thank you, Lisa. Which other acts have been adopted that have to be considered in the EU's cybersecurity strategy? The EU has, for example, adopted a so-called regulation on machinery, 
which further defines the mandatory essential health and safety requirements that machinery products placed on the European market need to fulfill. This regulation also comes with procedures for a conformity assessment of such products, which is indicated by the CE marking, which you might have already seen on some products. Given Internet of Things and other digital solutions such as robots and AI are on the rise, the machine regulation intends to better cover such new technologies. Manufacturers have to ensure that the machinery has been designed and constructed in accordance with the essential health and safety requirements, also including cyber-related safety requirements. They also have the responsibility to draw up a technical documentation and to carry out the relevant conformity assessment procedure to assess the risks associated with their machinery placed on the European market. The regulation will apply from 20th of January 2027, with some rules already applying on earlier dates. So there's still some, some time yeah. to, to go with respect to the machinery regulation. Not so with the EU Data Act. That's right, Roland. So also the EU Data Act contains several cybersecurity related requirements for what they call connected devices. Such devices need to follow a safety by design principle regarding the data accessibility for users. The Data Act does, however, not further specify the safety requirements required and which have to be met by the devices. The Data Act will already become applicable on 12th of September 2025, so not so much time is left, I'd say. Yeah, and if you're interested, uh, by the way, in more information on the Data Act, we highly recommend our episode of the Wolf Ties Soundshot podcast dedicated to the EU Data Act. Given the fast-paced uh, cybersecurity environment, there are currently also further proposals in the legislative pipeline of the EU. First and foremost, um, the EU has proposed a Cyber Resilience Act, which is a, a regulation on cybersecurity requirements for products with digital elements, as it's called. This aims at ensuring more secure hardware and software products given these are increasingly subject to successful and detrimental cyber attacks and offer at the same time a quite low level of cyber security. Under the proposed act, it will be ensured that manufacturers improve the security of products with digital elements already in the design and development phase and throughout the entire product lifecycle. The regulation also aims to tackle the lack of information and insufficient understanding thereof by users, preventing them from choosing products with uh, adequate cybersecurity properties or using them in a secure manner sometimes. Such products are not sufficiently covered by the current EU legal framework, although exploitation of vulnerabilities have uh, significantly uh, risen, causing immense financial losses. The Cyber Resilience Act is expected to enter into force still in 2024 and the manufacturers will have to apply the rules 36 months thereafter, which can be challenging if this is to be implemented in production processes and the like, of course. Last but not least, also the EU Artificial Intelligence Regulation, the so-called AI Act, tackles challenges from a cybersecurity perspective coming along with the increasing use of AI. As such, the Act addresses risks specifically created by AI applications and defines specific obligations for deployers and providers of high-risk AI applications, also in terms of safety. AI products will require a conformity assessment before a given AI system can be put into service or placed on the European market. And the AI system will have to undergo constant monitoring in terms of safety. So you could say that the EU cybersecurity strategy thus brings along many new rules to be followed, even by players that might not have put a special focus on cybersecurity at all in the past. While these new rules will definitely contribute to enhancing Europe's resilience towards cyber threats, it also brings along many challenges for companies as they are subject to numerous acts setting different requirements to be followed. Keeping up with all the latest developments in this fast-paced environment will keep companies definitely busy trying to keep their compliance frameworks up to date. 
Um, so there is a lot to consider in the cyber world. Uh, meeting all the requirements set out by the numerous regulations targeting cyber incidents requires establishing a profound compliance system, ensuring cyber incidents are being handled correctly or prevented in the first place. Mm -hmm. And this should especially include some sort of action plans on how to properly handle an incident to ensure that all the obligations arising from all the different laws are actually being met. And all these functions and responsibilities have to be assigned to a specific role yeah. within a person role in a, in, a, in a company, of course. So a lot to consider. And lack of compliance with these new cybersecurity regulations can lead to significant negative consequences for companies, with fines actually only being one of them. But the fines can be significant. The NIS2 directive, for instance, requires member states to foresee a maximum fine of at least 10 million euros or a maximum of at least 2% of the total worldwide annual turnover. This, this corresponds, by the way, to the exact figures of the GDPR yes. for not meeting the um, technical and organizational measures needed to be appropriately addressed. Yeah, and also in this regard, claims for damages, as you mentioned, that, uh, the GDPR in the aftermath of cyber incidents are on the rise. The European Court of Justice has recently dealt with several proceedings concerning immaterial damages as a consequence of cybersecurity incidents related to personal data under the GDPR. And given the various acts adopted, uh, bringing along new and strict compliance requirements in terms of security, not having implemented them properly could make controllers potentially liable for damages suffered by data subjects as a result of an incident following insufficient compliance measures. So not only fines, but also potential liabilities, um, damages to be considered in this respect. Yeah. Okay, so summing up, the earlier the better you start preparing for these upcoming um, requirements in terms of cyber security. And we hope this episode gave some insights on the main points of the new EU cyber security framework and Together with Lisa, we want to thank you for tuning in and wish you all the best in this respect. Thank you for listening. Bye. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Wolftai Soundshot. For more information, you can contact us via email at soundshot at or visit our website at www.wolftais.com. <laughs>